Recently, I've been on a science fiction binge. And when I say recently, I mean over the past two years or so. In that time, I've read The Martian, The Three-Body Problem, Solaris, Leviathan Wakes, Consider Flaybus and Player of Games, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I've also reread the Foundation trilogy in Dune. More recently, I started Seven Eves by Neil Stevenson and A Deepness in the Sky by Werner Vinge. It isn't just books, either. Gravity, Interstellar, Arrival, and the movie adaptations of Solaris and The Martian have been big hits with me. I even checked out the pilot to that new Amazon series, Oasis, starring Richard Madden from Game of Thrones. Game-wise, I've finished Stellaris, Soma, and The Talos Principle multiple times, and I recently got into Endless Space, too. With so much great science fiction out there, it's hard to feel burned out or overloaded, and to date this video, Blade Runner 2049 is on its way, and I cannot wait. It's this mood that has me wanting to revisit a game that I never gave much attention. Sid Meier's Civilization Beyond Earth. When it came out, it got criticism for being too similar to Civ V and not similar enough to Alpha Centauri, but I'm not sure I agree with the criticism. Imperfect as it may be, every time I come across Beyond Earth, it reminds me of how great the presentation in the game is, the flavor text, how inspiring the music is, and with figureheads like Elon Musk reminding us how vital it is to continue our efforts to liberate humanity of our singular ties to the Earth, the game's setting, colonization, feels special in a way, relevant. Now that I have Rising Tide and a total game overhaul called the Codex mod, I've been told by quite a few people that I need to give it a shot again. I have a love-hate relationship with the term headcanon, but I think for games like Beyond Earth, it can have a very positive effect. It might not dish out the philosophy of Solaris or the Talos Principle, the humor of the Martian and Hitchhiker's Guide, or the quality found in the culture, Dune, and Arrival, and some of the others, but with the books, movies, and games mentioned earlier fresh in my recent memory, Beyond Earth feels like it can be an easel on which I apply those things, those concepts and feelings, in any way I want. There are shortcomings in any game that can be forgotten, so long as you build an intimate headcanon. And so, with Seven Eves sitting on my desk next to me, I want to start up a Beyond Earth campaign to colonize, expand, and establish a new home for humanity, built just how I want. I have no idea how I'll come to adapt to the game and the mid to late game features that I haven't really encountered much before, and whether I'll react by tightening a dictatorial grip or work cooperatively with other settling nations to establish a diplomatic union of peace. Either way, I'm looking forward to it. Let's kick off with episode one. Okay, so to start this, we have to pick a sponsor. A sponsor is a corporation or union of nations or some sort of coalition that will support us as we stock our shuttle to take off from earth and colonize this new world now the codex mod has changed a lot i don't quite know what i'm looking at here so i'm gonna have to go through these one by one because uh, i want to pick an interesting faction to play as so we have alpha law which is comprised of a lot of middle eastern nations on earth looks like they pressure affinity, their affinity on other sponsors. And it looks like everybody has a penalty as well, a boon and a penalty. Governments require no technologies, but their penalty is lower yields from external trade routes. So they trade internally heavily. ARC, the American Reclamation Corporation. Covert operations are faster, reveal enemy cities when they're founded, but your cultures yield less culture. It's a big old corporation. The Pan-Asian Cooperative, which I think includes everything except for Korea. It might also exclude Japan. I, I think it's it's definitely China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, all of that. Um, let's see. So they are increased growth in their capital, which is neat. Big, big city. And increased production toward wonders, but they can't immediately adopt prosperity policies. Okay. Which makes sense, because combining some of these bonuses with prosperity would, would put them pretty far ahead of other people. The North Sea Alliance, which I believe is like Scotland, maybe part of the UK, Norwegian countries, uh, or Scandinavian countries, rather. <coughs> Production for naval, movement for naval, but buildings cost more. Franco-Iberia, which I read is, is France, Spain, Italy, um, and then a bunch of the North African nations. 
Effects that grant building modules per turn are increased building modules. That's a new mechanic as well. Metropolises yield extra culture, but you cannot construct industrial cities. So those are two things I'm not familiar with. Building modules and then industrial cities sounds like a, a focus you can give your cities. Slavic Federation, straightforward, is an increase in science that are in range of an orbital unit. Infrastructure, power grid plus three petroleum, okay, but borders expand slower. I like that a lot. Chung Su, base yields of beneficial covert operations are increased by a good bit. You start with two extra spies and you have lower growth of diplomatic capital. Chung Su is definitely like the, the Koreas. I'm not sure if it includes Japan or not though. Polystralia, that's also straightforward. Um, Increased trade capacity, increased yields from external and station trade routes, and lower yields from internal trade routes. That's awesome. I like that. The Kavithan Protectorate is, is an Indian faction. Increased global health. Cities have found faster, but they grow slower once they're founded. Integer is Germany slash Austria, I think. A couple of the kind of Central European nations. Um, diplomatic capital costs for units and buildings are reduced. Agreements cost 75% less. So a lot of diplomacy and politics. Rushing buildings costs extra energy. I don't know how much of a debuff that is. I don't know how often you rush buildings in this unless you're really trying to make up for a, a build order gamble. Brasilia, straightforward extra energy and science when you kill a unit, so very militaristic. Plus one vision range for all units, and it takes longer to build buildings. And then the African Union. Extra yields from specialists. Specialists consume no food, and you cannot construct mines or generators. Wow, okay. So I don't know how specialists work. I would hope they would kind of make up for the cannot construct mines or generators, because that's a big deal. Hmm. Out of all of these right now, every time I launch the game, I feel like I play as Franco-Iberia. Um, I would be down to try the Pan-Asian Cooperative, the Slavic Federation, and perhaps either Kavithan Protectorate or African Union. I'm thinking about the Slavic Federation. I like that. That and the Asian Pan-Asian Cooperative. So these guys are extra petroleum. Extra science and range of orbital units. I wonder if you get orbital units more frequently in this. That feels like a mid, especially late game boost or buff. Borders expand slower. 50% slower, that's a good bet. Versus increased capital growth and increased production toward wonders. Um, I... You know, it's a tough decision because having recently read The Three-Body Problem, I kind of want to play as the Pan-Asian Cooperative, but also having read Solaris, I kind of want to play as the Slavic Federation. So it's a tough call. Um, and there's nothing stopping me from doing both once I finish one, trying out the other. I, I think I'm going to roll with the Slavic Federation. I like the mid to late game science boost. And I don't think the border expansion is going to bother me too much. Usually, in Civ games, I, I kind of just do a lot of strategic land purchasing anyway, and I don't bother too much with waiting to expand to the tiles that I want, so let's go with that. So now we have to choose the colonists, the people who are coming along for the ride and, and are going to be the bulk of the initial colonists on the world. So we have scientists, we have refugees who provide food, we have aristocrats who provide energy, which is essentially money in this game. Engineers are production, artists for culture, diplomats for extra diplomatic capital. Doctors increase health, which is really good, but lower production. Colonists require, okay, so with pioneers, colonists require less production. With instructors, workers require less and trade requires less, that's really good. Veterans reduce the production cost for soldiers and rangers. Scouting Corps, extra movement and vision to explorers, I like that. Collectors start with three random old earth artifacts. Zoologists, you gain an alien artifact whenever you found a city, except for your capital. That's neat. 
Archaeologists gain a 15% chance to discover a progenitor artifact when to finishing an expedition, and elders gain a free resource pod whenever you found a city, including your capital. Including your capital. Resource pods are nice. I don't know if I'm going to go for that. I'm liking these that are... Like, Collectors is cool, but that's an initial boon. It doesn't really stick through the whole game. I really like Instructors... I don't have to buy workers and trade units because they just take so much less time to build. I don't know if I'm going to go military yet, so I don't know if veterans is the route I want to take. I, I might be peaceful, so that's a bit too preemptive. And as for the rest of these, I mean, these are, these are all great. I could capitalize on the Russian boost to science by bringing scientists. And I think I will. Instructors is really close behind. And same with zoologists. Getting an alien artifact every time you found a city. But the number of times that that, that that special trait will ding is fewer than, than a lot of these others. Instructors is really tempting. I'm going to go with scientists, though. We're sending a ship full of scientists to this new world. Which makes sense. All right. So now we're building a spacecraft. The actual ship that's going to take our colonists from the base of the Slavic Federation to this new world. So we could attach a supply module, which starts us with two extra resource pods near the capital, a short range scanner, which increases vision range during planet fall, increases the number of landing spots that I can pick, and I don't need technology to see petroleum. What is my boost? Infrastructure power grid gives extra petroleum. Okay, so that could be a good one. Electromagnetic sensor, where you reveal all the artifacts on the map, which is pretty powerful, and no technology is needed to see geothermal energy. I like that, and that might make up for um, being average as far as geothermal energy. You know, I've got a boon to petroleum already. Maybe I don't need to min-max it. Maybe I need to balance something else out. Long-range scanner reveals all coastlines on the map. That is immensely powerful. Metal sensor, you start with three titanium, and you don't need technology to see titanium dropship module you get a free explorer placed randomly on the map that is that's really cool that's actually um that that could be useful or it might not be i mean it helps you reveal the map but given that it's early game and explorers don't have very many expeditions which are their ability to excavate ruins and, and artifacts and all kinds of things he would run out pretty quickly and he would be far from home so he couldn't refill i'm not sure Pod scanner, reveal all resource pods on the map. Reveal some plots adjacent to resource pods, that's cool. And colonization module, start with a free colonist, but minus three production in all cities during the first 40 turns of the game. Wow, okay, so an early second city. However, those two cities will grow very slowly. I think that's a very interesting play to make. I think I'm gonna go for the electromagnetic sensor, I think. Because it reveals all artifacts, and when I see the artifacts, I can tell whether they're offshore or onshore. I think I'll do that. <coughs> and lastly, we have to choose the cargo, so the, the majority of what we bring with us, or some of the, the notable equipment that we bring with us on this ship. An ultrasonic emitter, I believe is a fence that scares off aliens and it deals damage per turn to nearby aliens all right a weapon arsenal starts us with a soldier a worker cast starts us with a free worker and this worker has four improvement charges titanium storage where you start with six titanium petroleum tank for six petroleum energy tank for six geothermal standardization module you start with 250 building modules tracker module you start with extra trade capacity combat module with extra military capacity and dark brotherhood start with an extra spy so some of these are speaking in terms that i don't quite understand because of the codex mod i think i'm gonna go for standardization modules because extra building modules sounds pretty neat pretty useful for an early development of a city i wish i knew what that did i'm gonna play with that let's see what that does 250 building modules 
The final step here is to pick which world we're going to. We have this assembly, this college of scientists here who've come together to discuss the candidates for colonization that we're going to address. I like to pick from the start of three, and I think I'm gonna go with Atherholt. So we have three worlds that they've found and presented us with. We have Atherholt, which is a continental kind of Terran world, similar to Earth, although it's relatively arid. We have Antenes, which is a primordial Protean world, which is a bit Pangaea-like. It's a singular, um, very large continent with a couple islands off the edge, but it's primordial. And that is an interesting challenge. It's a primeval, a very young world, a very new world. Um, that could be fun, but I'm not gonna pick that. Uh, we also have Griffin, which is arid like Atherholt, but it's Atlantean. Instead of having large continental masses, it has uh, shattered islands all over the world. It's, it's primarily an ocean world. As cool as that sounds, I think I'm gonna go with Atherholt because of its continental structure. Um, I don't really know how the resources are going to be working in Codex, but I want to, or rather, I like to think that we have a better shot at finding more resources and more room to settle if we settle on a Terran world. Even though we could settle aquatic cities and work aquatic tiles on the Atlantean world, I think I'm going to go with the Terran world. So, with Atherholt chosen as our new home, let's see how she looks. Okay, here we are. Home, and it's very arid, it's very dry. We have plains and a lot of savanna grassland, dry grassland though. Canyons, a lot of resources. We have fungus, we have fruit, we have copper. Our forests are really interesting, they're like these desert plants, these, these cone-shaped plants, they look like they've adapted to capture any meager amount of rainwater that this world might have and channel it down to their base for nutrients. Offshore we have floatstone, we have a submerged nest. I don't really like the sound of that. And then we have some nice coral reefs all along the shelf here before it turns into deep ocean. So I'm gonna go ahead and settle. Uh, this is the zone that our lander can touch down in. And its position will kind of determine the immediate resources I get access to. So settling down here on this hill means uh, I will have access to every tile in a circle around it. So the fruit, the copper, the fungus. If I settle up here, I will only get the fruit and then I'll have a bunch of ocean tiles. There is coral up here, though. I'll have access to this coral, which is increased production. These icons, for anybody who's unfamiliar, the apples are food, the gears are production. This uh, yellow symbol with the little S-like thing is, uh, that's energy. These books are culture, these beakers are science. Um, I want early growth. I'll still have access to this two-production hill if I settle on this lower one. Well, I won't have access to the production from the coral, I'll have access to all this extra food from the copper and fungus, and that means early growth. These green clouds are miasma, and that damages my units, and so I want to clean that up pretty quickly. Let's go ahead and settle. Right on top of this hill. Here we are on our new home, Planet Specifics, Biome 21D. Decades ago, your people left Old Earth to journey into an unknown future, hoping to reach a faraway place and start anew. Finally, you arrive at what will be your new home. As your people leave the ship and take the first steps into their new lives, the scanning process of the Planet Specifics is finally done, and the results are available for you to examine. Fungus on this world provides extra food and culture boost. Very good. Well, now I'm glad I settled down here near the fungus. And we have geothermal energy right here, revealed by our electromagnetic scanners. And we've also revealed all of the anomalies that bear investigating around the world, which include a crashed satellite there, a derelict settlement from someone who got here just before me, 
didn't work out for them, it seems. Strange skeletons off the coast. So what's close to me? We have Progenitor Ruin. We've got a resource pod right there. That's very good. We've got Alien Skeleton there. So I'll go ahead and investigate those. And we've got another Progenitor Ruin up here. Very interesting. And our first sign of alien life. On top of the coral, another reason that I'm glad I didn't settle there, is a young leech. Whatever that is. I don't know what it's going to do, and I'm not going to attack it yet. Uh, the aliens don't really know me yet. I haven't shown any hostility, so let's wait and see what happens. So, before I get into the details... Oh, we have another leech. Oh no, we have a leech on our fungus. Okay, something's going to have to be done about that. I wonder if I can scare it away. Whatever it is, it's an easy fight. My soldiers, my marines here can kill it instantly. Minimal damage. So before I get into the, the way that this game functions, let me just familiarize myself really quickly. So this, we've got trade routes. We've got a log of notifications. We founded the city of Pobeda. May it lead us into a bright future. After a long journey, we finally arrived at our new home. Our scanners show that the planet is more dangerous than we had hoped for. Large predators inhabit parts of its surface. Oh, okay, that's um, that's good, that's cool. So we have all of these different, okay, we can filter the notification log. Military-wise, we've got a list of our soldiers. So two soldiers and one ranger. Economy-wise, we've got our capital city, its output, so the food, the science, the energy, the culture, and the production, as well as its contribution toward health or negative health. All of our strategic resources, the 250 extra building modules we brought along, the energy per turn, so we're gross 10, expense 6, our net is 4, and our units are costing us the 6 right there, those uh, 6 total expenses. Okay. Leaders, we have General Vadim Kozlov, and he has a unique character trait. And that is the plus 20% science in cities in range of orbital units that we talked about earlier. We have no wonders, no agreements. We're earning four diplomatic capital per turn. We've got our affinities there. Okay. Active events going on in the world. We have an empire tab, which is locked. A moon base tab, which is locked. Golden age, which is locked. Commonwealth, which is locked. We have our affinity tracker here. And this is, this is all new. This is awesome. I'm, I'm really, really happy with this. So we've got a dominant affinity. Total number of citizens that ascribe to certain affinities within my empire. Affinity per turn is increased by 1% for every citizen devoted to it. And on the world, we're here as well. Nobody's really picked any affinities yet. Social cohesion. While empires that are open to multiple ideologies are able to combine their strengths, empires dominated by a single ideology benefit from higher social cohesion, which makes the people work more efficiently. All cities will gain benefits if you keep the percentage of people following your dominant affinity above certain thresholds. An empire must have at least 50 citizens following an ideology for these effects to become active. So we have bonuses to diplomacy, diplomatic capital rather, food culture and eventually science here we can track our cities and their affinity breakdowns and we can pay diplomatic capital to boost and pressure certain dominant affinities by 300 percent oh my gosh that's awesome and then we have bonuses harmony purity and supremacy are the three affinities and for anybody who hasn't played beyond earth this is what they do harmony assumes that once we reach this new world humans try to integrate into the world become a part of its biology we research ways to blend our biology with the, the aliens here, the plant life here, to where we can consume and really become a part of this world. It's a sort of harmony with what is found in the world in general. Purity is the exact opposite. It's the idea that humanity needs to remain human, that we don't adopt any sort of strange alien features, any sort of amoeba, anything into our lives, that we are at our core human and we should stay human and that any sort of challenges we face in this world, we can adapt to them. Supremacy is the idea that both of those other groups are wrong and instead we need to integrate technology that we research both now and technology we researched in the past into humanity and become sort of cyborg-like um, 
kind of a, a tech super race. And each one you can see has benefits. The more population that you have following one of these uh, affinities, the more bonuses you get. So that's pretty straightforward. We have all our affinities listed in the top left. We have all of our resources and other traits in the top right. For example, our health, our colony health is 12, which is very good. We have uh, some interesting ways we could go. I want to collect this resource pod and I want to start exploring the rest of this continent that I'm on. Although I don't start with an explorer. That's something that I'm going to need to build in my city. This is the city viewer. This lets me view everything that relates to Pobeda. The population is currently one. Um, not necessarily one. The idea is it's like a hundred, a thousand, something like that. But we have one unit, whatever that, that unit is, of population. And that unit is assigned to currently farm these fruit here, which are very edible, and that provides three food. So we can manage our citizens, of which we only have one for now. Four more turns until a new citizen is born. We currently have a headquarters and basic infrastructure, which provide all of those resources there. And we have a production tree. We've got former, which is a worker. We've got explorers, which I'm probably going to build soon. We've got a patrol boat, soldier. We've got these protocols, suppression, development, and colonization. And we've got ser several buildings, and, and this is going to expand significantly as the game goes on. For anybody who hasn't played, the more technology we research, the more we find, uh, the more things become available here. But currently, the very first things we can build on this new world of ours, an old earth clinic, an old earth laboratory, an old earth reactor, an old earth recycler, an old earth relic, and an old earth vivarium. There's a lot to take in here, and I'm excited to dive into it. I'm going to go ahead and stop this here and start episode two with the first full turn of decisions, and we'll see how we can start to adapt to this world. Until then, thanks for watching.